would welcome everyone um, from Medical Aid for Palestinians and the Council on Arab British Understanding, CARBU, to today's event discussing the impact of the COVID 19 pandemic response on the mental health of Palestinian healthcare workers. Just a couple of technical notes before we get started. Um, as Rohan has just mentioned in the chat, we are joined by both panelists who will be speaking in Arabic and in English. And we're grateful to have live interpretation provided by Haifa to hear the interpretation in English or Arabic. You can select the interpretation button on the bottom of your screen and select your preferred language from there. Also to note that the meeting is being recorded and is being live streamed on YouTube. Um, so you can go back and watch it there um, if you miss any parts today as well. So my name is Hala Kia. I'm the Research and Advocacy Officer at Medical Aid for Palestinians. For those of you that aren't familiar with our work, we are a development and health organization with offices in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, and in Lebanon. We work with local partners um, to achieve a future where all Palestinians can, affect, can access an effective, sustainable, and locally led system of healthcare and can access the full realization of their rights to health and dignity as well. Over the last 18 months, much of our work has focused on the emergency response to a COVID-19 pandemic, um, aiming to slow the spread of infection by providing hygiene kits and PPE, as well as providing essential medical supplies and training for healthcare staff in Palestine as well. To learn more about our work, um, please do go to our website at www.map.org.uk. We're also very grateful to have our colleagues from Kabu joining us and hosting this event with us who have been doing great parliamentary work, um, Palestinians as well. We did mention that we'd be joined by Dr. Rosella, Rosanna Allen Khan today. Um, unfortunately, she had a last minute parliamentary commitment and so is unable to join us at the beginning of the event, um, but she will try to join us towards the end, hopefully for the question and answer portion. As I mentioned, we're here to discuss the findings and recommendations of a new map briefing paper um, entitled Dealing with Death and Distress, the Impact of COVID-19 on Mental Health of uh, Palestinian Healthcare Workers. As I'm sure we're all familiar and we all know, the pandemic has put a severe strain on healthcare systems globally and healthcare workers in particular in the, in the challenge of controlling the virus have directly faced its consequences um, on their mental health. In this new map research, healthcare workers in the occupied Palestinian territory revealed how shortages of medicines and personal protective equipment, PPE, restrictions on their movement and the experiences of witnessing the suffering of patients has left them physically and mentally exhausted after the past year. With the arrival of the Delta variant, um, which is more contagious and more de deadly in the occupied Palestinian territory, it threatens to worsen the situation for the Palestinian healthcare system, already re rendered fragile, fragmented, and unprepared by the decades-long military occupation and 14-year legal closure of Gaza. This week, the World Health Organization warned that with growing Delta cases being detected, um, a fourth wave is around the corner for Palestinians. According to our panelist and a researcher at MAP, uh, Celine says that this will, Celine Jabot has told us that this will threaten a severe mental health crisis among the depleted Palestinian healthcare workforce. The conversation is particularly important today and for us in the UK in light of recent cuts to UK overseas assistance. And given that UK aid through the European Union's Pegasi mechanism, mechanism supported salaries for more than 37,000 health and educational professionals in the West Bank in 2019, and that is funding that needs to be protected in light of the challenges that healthcare workers are facing. We're here to discuss the findings of the report and its implications for, here, for us here in the UK with Celine Jabber, as I mentioned, as well as Ibrahim Zakut and Zema, Zena Amar, um, who are grateful to them all for joining us. Celine is the former advocacy and communication officer at Medical Aid for Palestinians based in the occupied territory and was a researcher contributing to this report and this briefing paper um, on dealing with death and distress. Celine was previously the freedom of, freedom of movement coordinator at Physicians for Human Rights and holds a master's degree in international relations and diplomacy. 
Dr. Ibrahim Zakir is the head of nursing at the oncology department of Al Rantisi Hospital in Gaza and was on the front lines and has been on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic response and was interviewed for this research. So we're very grateful to have him join us. And lastly, we have Zena Ahmed, who's an assistant professor at Birzeit University and a mental health consultant for MAP. Her work focuses on mental health and well-being in the context of displacement, contact, conflict, and war. And Zena also assisted in the research for this project. So we're very grateful to have all three, um, all three panelists with us today. We'll begin with Celine kind of discussing an overview of the report, its findings, and the methodology before we have a question and answer session with Dr. Ibrahim about his experiences dealing with the pandemic before we pass over to Zena, back to Celine, and then we'll close out with a question and answer session. Um, throughout the chat, throughout the conversation, please do post your questions in the chat and we'll keep an eye out for those to ask at the end. And again, just to remind you all that we will be translating into English and in Arabic. Um, and so do please select your channel at the bottom there by going to interpretation and selecting your preferred language. Um, after all of that, I'll pass over to Celine. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and please take it away. Thank you, Hala, and thank you everyone for joining us today to learn more about the impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, on healthcare workers uh, in uh, the occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, so for this briefing paper, uh, MAP interviewed healthcare workers uh, in occupied Palestinian territories to examine how a COVID-19 pandemic has uh, impacted their well-being and uh, mental, mental health. Uh, we have conducted interviews with 17 healthcare workers uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories. Seven uh, healthcare workers were located in the West Bank, six uh, uh, in Gaza, and four in uh, East Jerusalem. Uh, this cohort included doctors, nurses, lab technicians, uh, paramedics uh, who were identified for interviews through uh, the Palestinian Ministry of Health and through MAPS local uh, partner organizations. Um, we have asked uh, 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 healthcare workers about sources of distress uh, during the pandemic, their workload, uh, particular moments of hardship, uh, what kind of support uh, was available for them and uh, what kind of support they wished uh, to receive, and their coping mechanisms. Uh, their responses were transcribed and uh, recurring uh, themes and issues were identified. Uh, healthcare workers spoke openly about high rates of uh, poor mental health outcomes, including burnouts, anxiety, uh, depression, distress. Uh, some have described their work experience as a never-ending nightmare or feeling as if they were drowning or an urgent rush to leave everything behind and just escape and get lost in a forest. Um, one health, health care worker uh, from Gaza mentioned uh, that operating during the pandemic was uh, much more challenging mentally and physically for him uh, than the past three wars on Gaza. It is important to note that these interviews were conducted uh, prior to Israel's uh, large-scale military assault on Gaza in May 2021 and the protests in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, which have been also met by uh, systematic ex uh, use of excessive force. Israel's bombardment uh, on Gaza did not only further degrade the capacity of hospitals and clinics uh, and exacerbated the pressures and strains experienced by uh, Palestinian healthcare workers, but have also led to the killing of uh, two senior doctors and one psychologist in Gaza. Dr. Uh, uh, Muayn Al Alul, uh, uh, Gaza's top neurologist, and uh, Dr. Ayman Al Alouf, uh, head of internal medicine and uh, COVID 19 response at the Shifa. Uh, hospital and psychologist Raja Abu Al uh, along with their family and relatives. So, what were the main sources of distress for uh, Palestinian healthcare workers during the outbreak of a global pandemic? One of the main uh, sources uh, was uh, unpreparedness and uh, unreadiness and shortages, shortages of essential health uh, care resources, financial and humane. Uh, the pandemic arrived to an already fragile healthcare system, uh, undergoing de-development and lacking human, financial, and material resources as a result of decades of uh, occupation, uh, blockade, and uh, uh, fragmentation. Um, this challenge impacted the mental health of uh, healthcare workers and their job performance. Uh, 
uh, many healthcare workers reported that they had to deal with COVID in an environment of shortages in, in resources such as medicine, disposables, uh, personal protective equipments, and lack of professional skills to deal with COVID-19 patients. Dr. Ibrahim uh, Zakut can clarify more about uh, this point um, uh, in the next uh, uh, Q&A uh, uh, session. And uh, moreover, several healthcare workers reported uh, buying uh, personal protective equipments uh, uh, at their own expenses. A paramedic from Gaza told uh, um, told us that uh, he had to buy his own uh, masks and gloves uh, uh, on his own expense. And he was very stressed of getting infected and infecting his family. Um, healthcare workers acknowledged that the capacities of uh, the fragmented Palestinian health system cannot handle a global pandemic. And uh, one of the healthcare workers in Gaza told us that they were anticipating a catastrophe. Uh, another main source of distress uh, reported by healthcare workers was becoming a source of infection to their colleagues, vulnerable patients, and uh, more importantly, infecting their uh, loved ones. Healthcare workers are in regular contact with patients who are uh, at high risk, uh, risk of becoming a source of transmission of uh, COVID-19. Three quarters of our interviewees expressed a fear of becoming a source of infection and making other people ill. They have reported feeling of guilt uh, uh, for becoming a source of infection. Uh, this feeling was intensified when the number of infections uh, and deaths increased when there was scarcity of adequate personal protection protective equipments, and when operating in locations where implementing social distancing uh, me measures uh, was difficult. Um, the reported feelings of guilt uh, by uh, uh, healthcare workers uh, stems from their sense of responsibility toward their families, uh, community members, uh, patients, uh, and their co-workers. Co um, according to Health Cluster, around uh, 5,000 Palestinian health uh, workers have been infected by COVID, uh, with COVID-19. Uh, therefore, some healthcare workers isolated themselves from their family members by choice and have refrained from visiting or letting uh, their uh, children uh, uh, to visit their extended family, uh, who they were uh, their main source of support. And this leads us to another source of uh, uh, distress uh, experienced by uh, Palestinian healthcare workers, uh, which is isolation and loneliness. However, not, not everyone who did feel the need to separate and isolate uh, themselves from uh, their family uh, or felt the burden of being a source of infection uh, could isolate uh, uh, and uh, distance uh, themselves from their families. Due to the reality of how crowded and densely populated uh, Gaza City is, uh, not all uh, healthcare workers were able uh, to implement social distancing measures, whether at work, uh, whether at their working places or at home. Thus, they were left to live with a sense of guilt and uh, responsibility, with no option of protecting their uh, families uh, and community. Uh, one paramedic in Gaza described how he lives in house uh, along with his family, daughter, and extended family, with no space or separation. According to the UN OSHA, around 50% uh, of Gaza's population lack a, a separate room uh, and bathroom uh, for members who test positive. Um, healthcare workers felt that uh, this pan pandemic entrenched the isolation they felt and separated them more from their fellow uh, health practitioners in Palestine and abroad. Uh, they shared their inability to seek support from Palestinian and international colleagues, as well as not being able to, uh, to be trained uh, and prepared to deal with the pandemic due to the uh, uh, restrictions on movement. Um, another source of distress uh, exper experienced by healthcare workers was uh, social stigma and lack of recognition. Um, healthcare workers reported experiencing social stigma during the pandemic as a result of uh, communities' perception and being regularly exposed to COVID-19. Uh, this perception applied to healthcare workers whether they work directly in COVID-19 uh, with COVID-19 patients or indirectly. Um, uh, healthcare workers uh, reported frustration to be stigmatized after risking their lives uh, and working in the front line to save uh, other uh, people's lives. Interviewees reported that 
stigma and impacted not only themselves, but also their family members. A lab technician in Hebron told us that his son uh, was also uh, stigmatized uh, when one of his classmates uh, refused to sit next to him in, uh, in the classroom, uh, claiming that he was infectious uh, due to his uh, father's work in a lab. Uh, lab. Um, I invite Thank you. you. Um, thank you so much for presenting the recommendations of the report. I wonder if it would actually be great to hear from Dr. Ibrahim um, about his experiences. We're going to pass over to the Q&A with Dr. Ibrahim right now, um, and then we'll come back to Celine to talk about the recommendations from the report a little bit later. But just as a reminder, this will be in Arabic. So for those of you wanting to listen in English, make sure you have your interpretation switched on at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I'll pass back to Celine. Thank you, Hala. Marhaba, Ustaz Ibrahim. Tidar bast im le mute. Ah, tamam. Marhaba. Ibrahim Zakut, Masul Tamrid al Auram, from the Sashfar Rantisi, Odu for Legend Mab UK, the Breast Cancer. وعضو في لجنة الماب يوكي للكولون كانسر وعضو في الهيئة الوطنية لتطوير الأورام وعضو في لجنة تقييم مستشفى صداقة تركي لتحويل مستشفى أورام مستقبلا إن تم ذلك طبعا شاركت كثير شغلات في تطوير الأورام في قطاع غزة خاصة تطوير التمريض الأورام وبنسعى إنه إن شاء الله نقدم شيء يعني شيء محترم لمرضى الأوراق في قطاع غزة رغم شح الإمكانيات وشح الموارد. شكرا أستاذ إبراهيم أستاذ إبراهيم كمان حابة أسألك إيش كانت التحديات لإلك كشخص اللي بيشتغل بمجال الصحة وخاصة بقسم الأورام بغزة خلال فترة الكورونا؟ احنا بصراحة في خلال فترة الكورونا وما قبل فترة كورونا يعني احنا في قطاع وزارة الصحة خاصة خدمة تمريض الأورام أو خدمة الأورام خدمة الأورام بشكل عام تعاني من نقص شديد جدا في جميع الموارد تعاني من نقص شديد يعني فيما قبل الكورونا كانت تعاني من نقص تقريبا ما يعادل 40% في الأدوية أدوية الأورام تعاني أو 60% في بعض الأحيان و40% مستلزمات الخاصة في مرضى الأورام نعاني من من ضيق المكان اللي نحن موجودين فيه وكان مكان مؤقت لمرضى الأورام بسبب أمور إنشائية كانت في المكان وطبعا لم يتم إكماله لحتى الآن بنعاني من هذا من هذا الضيق طبعا جاءت كورونا ففاقمت الأمور وزادت المعاناة بشكل مضاعف أصبحنا نعاني من 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 شح الإمكانيات بسبب كورونا وشح الإمكانيات الموجودة في الأصل فكنا نعاني من مشاكل مزدوجة بصراحة كنا نعاني من أنه في البدايات ما كانش في بي بي إيز متوفرة للجميع كانوا مثلا يوفروا بي بي إيز كومبيت بي بي إيز لجزء من الطاقم اللي بتعامل بشكل دايركت كونتاكت مع المرضى الكورونا فيروس البواقي كان يعني المتوفر مجرد يعني ماسك عادي سيرجيكال ماسك وكاون عادي باقي البي بي ايز ما كانتش متوفرة كان في صعوبة في توفيرها كان في صعوبة حتى في توفير الماسكات مما يعني اضطرنا انه أنا شخصيا عملت ماسك شغل يدوي يعني انا عملته عندي في البيت ووزعته على الطواقم بحيث انه ممكن يعني ريوز يعني ممكن يستخدم اكثر من مره ينغسل الكلور والصابونه بحيث انه يتعقم ويلتبس مره ثانيه على اساس انه نقدر نتجاوز هذه المشكله طبعا المرضى ما بتقدر انت تجي يعني توفر لهم الماسكات اللي كان يجي على المستشفى فجزء كبير كان منهم يجي بدون ماسك كان يصل المستشفى ما في معه ماسك كان يدخل المكان بدون ماسك طبعا اللي بحب انوه له انه انا من ضمن الاشخاص التي اصيبت بالكورونا فيروس كنت انا وطبيب زميلنا وزميله ممرضه في نفس المكان وصلنا تقريبا في فتره زمنيه موحده واحده يعني تقريبا في بدايه نوفمبر زميلتي في المكان يعني وصلت إلى درجة خطيرة في من المرض 
زميل الدكتور خالد ثابت اصيب لدرجه انه دخل العنايه المركزه الاي سي يو انا يعني كانت الاصابه عندي شديده ولكن يعني خلينا نقول متوسطه لم احتاج الى دخول مستشفى لكن كان كنت محجور يعني طبعا في نفس الفتره كمان اصيبت زوجتي فكنت انا وزوجتي في نفس في نفس الحجر يعني آه الحمد لله يعني من دعاء يمكن المرضى اللي احنا بنحاول نخدمهم انه تجاوزنا الازمه تجاوزها الدكتور خالد ثابت رغم انه كان يعني في وضع سيء جدا جدا وبحب يعني احكي انه انا لا حد او لا اكثر ما يزيد من ست شهور وانا اعاني انا وزميلي وزميلتي نعاني من اثار الكورونا الحمد لله الان بدات تخف تخف الاعراض او المشاكل كنا نعاني منها الجي اي مثلا بقينا نعاني حتى فتره قريبه يعني عدنا الى العمل نمارس عملنا عادي يعني طبعا باتخاذ بعض الاجراءات الوقائيه اكثر لكن بقي بقي التاثير النفسي شديد علينا في هذه الفتره استاذ ابراهيم كمان عندي كمان سؤال ايش تاثير هاي التحديات عليك على نفسيا من ناحيه نفسيه او على زملائك سواء ضغط العمل العمل مع مع مرضى السرطان وكمان انتشار الوباء زي ما انت ذكرت انه في ازدواجيه بال بالمعيقات وبالتحديات اللي كانت عندكم كيف كانت تاثر عليك هاي الاشياء طبعا احنا بصراحه يعني تربطنا في مرضى الاورام خاصه انه يعني مريض يتغير يعني بزور المكان اكثر من مره ممكن مرتين وثلاثه في الشهر خلال الشهر الواحد فتربطنا فيهم علاقه طيبه يعني لما انت بتتعامل مع مريض في عنده جاي على المستشفى رغم الخوف من الكورونا انا يعني في بعض بذكر بعض المرضى غاب عن العلاج لمده ثلاث شهور او اربع شهور من المتابعه خوف من انه يجي من موضوع كورونا لانه بيعرف اذا اصيب من كورونا وهو مريض سرطان ممكن يعني تؤدي الى الوفاه فكان تابع معنا احيانا على التليفون في بعض الشغلات اللي لما يعاني من شغلات كثير مهمه فكنا ننصح انه لازم يجي على المستشفى طبعا بنعاني من انه المرضى في جزء منهم بدناش نقول كثير يعني جزء بيعاني من الجهل بما هي ما هو كورونا يعني وخاصه انه يعني الاشاعات المنتشره انه بتقلل من من خطوره كورونا في ناس تقتنع فيها كنا نعاني من التعامل مع هؤلاء الناس كنا نعاني انه انت مش قادر كمان توفر البي بي ايز للمرضى المريض بيجي مش ماخذ احتياطاته عنده نقص في الادويه جاي وممكن يصل المستشفى وما يلاقيش العلاج متوفر العلاج يكون مقطوع ممكن يجي ويلاقي الامكانيات غير متوفره ازدحام في المكان المكان كثير كثير مزدحم عندنا احنا المكان مهيئ انه يستقبل 40 او 50 او 50 مريض في اليوم كنا نستقبل ما يقارب من 200 مريض ولا زلنا في اليوم الواحد فكان المكان كراود كثير 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 ف يعني صعب انه احنا نمنع المريض انه يجي يتابع علاجه او يجي يتابع المشكله تبعته الصحيه وفي نفس الوقت مش لا يوجد امكانيه لتوفير مكان افضل او توفير تباعد ما بين الناس وتوفير الوقايه من من الامراض يعني من ضمن المشاهد اللي احنا بنشوفها انه على مدخل العياده المكان لا يتجاوز المترين مربع بكون في 10 او 15 مريض يعني يقفوا في هذا المكان وهذا طبعا بسبب خطر شديد عليهم لكن اضطرارهم انه بده يتلقى العلاج طبعا بيجعلهم من يغامروا بعد كل هذا تخيلي انه بيجي يصل المريض الى المكان ولا يجد العلاج يعني يعني تشاهد الحسره والالم والعذاب في عين المريض وانت مش لا تستطيع انك تقدمي له اي خدمه فهذا كمان باثر على نفسيتنا احنا يعني انا لما بشوف المريض والحسره اللي في عينيه يعني بيجي خايف وخايف من العلاج ولما يصل ويعرف انه العلاج متوفر تنقلب الخوف الى حصره فبتصير مزيج من المشاعر من عندنا احنا طواقم طبيه كل هذا بياثر على نفسيتنا بصراحه كثير من الاحيان كنا نعود الى البيت والانسان يعني في حاله صحيه يعني حاله نفسيه سيئه جدا من المشاهد اللي بيشوفها سيئه لانه مش قادر يقدم خدمه لبعض المرضى سيئه لانه في بعض المرضى بخصوك في بعض المرضى بكون جارك بعض المرضى بكون قريبك وتعتذر عن تقديم الخدمه بتكون كثير مؤلمه وكثير يعني بالنسبه لنا نعتبر كاتاستروفيك يعني 
ديوريشن لكن يعني بنحاول ان بنحاول ان احنا نخفف عن المريض بنحاول ان احنا ندعمه نفسيا لكن طبعا قناعه المريض تبقى هي انه المريض العلاج في الاخر غير متوفر يعني شكرا كثير دكتور ابراهيم واحنا عن جد ممتنين لك ولجهودك ولكل الطاقم الطبي بغزه وبالضفه وبفلسطين كلها شكرا كثير لك شكرا لك وبتمنى انه نقدر نقدم شيء لمرضى الاورام اللي شكرا. فعلا يعني احنا حتى في في اجازاتنا في في اوقات الفراغ تبعتنا في الليل في النهار مرضانا بيتصلوا وبيسالونا ايش صار واحنا بنحاول نخفف عنهم رغم انه هذا خارج وقت الدوام لكن احنا بنحاول ان نساعدهم على قدر المستطاع بتمنى ان نصل الى مرحله نقدر نساعدهم ونقدم لهم خدمات Thank you Dr. Ibrahim and thank you Celine both so much we're really grateful to have had you both yeah um and yeah for all of your work throughout the pandemic as well I'll pass over to Zaina Amar now to take over Thank you Hala وشكرا كثير سيلين وشكرا استاذ ابراهيم على الكلمات اللي بتوضح لنا كثير تعقيدات النظام الصحي اللي بيواجهه العاملين الصحيين so i wanted to thank ibrahim and selin for really highlighting how complex of a situation uh, that we're discussing when we're talking about the mental health of healthcare workers. Um, says Brahim brings uh, the, his personal experience, which um, uh, he has had and continues to have as someone who's experienced COVID and someone who's a nurse and someone who lives in Gaza and someone who um, tries to provide care in uh, really really uh, resource scarce um, uh, context and as my um, uh, colleague Celine has already uh, um, like presented unpreparedness uh, and, and resource scarcity was one of the main uh, uh, issues that healthcare workers experienced and caused them great distress and frustration I want to note that, uh, as Brahim also noted, this is something that didn't only uh, arise at the time of the beginning of COVID, but this is something that has been happening and has been experienced long before COVID, and it was exacerbated after the beginning of COVID. Um, uh, and, and it wasn't only uh, the unpreparedness and, and resource scarcity that uh, uh, um, was present before COVID and continued uh, throughout COVID, but it is also the working conditions that were very difficult for many of the uh, healthcare workers that also started before COVID and were exacerbated after COVID, causing great distress, but also frustration for many of the healthcare workers. Um, so I wanted to just pick up on, on, on these two things that um, uh, my colleague and, and Ibrahim discussed a little bit uh, so that we continue with the same flow. Um, uh, another thing I wanted to kind of pick up from what uh, Celine has mentioned is the complexity of the situation. Um, I know that in the briefing, we try to uh, touch upon each of the, of the themes in very separate fashion, it's very neat and organized, but the actual experience of these feelings, uh, the, the experiential dimension um, is actually way more complex uh, because these feelings, the, the frustration, the feeling of loneliness, the guilt, um, uh, the interaction with family and colleagues and the community all exist at the same time. So the coexistence of these feelings um, uh, is important to note and, and to, to, to uh, understand that we cannot uh, separate these things. Just as much as we cannot separate the experiential uh, dimension of these feelings, we cannot also separate them from the context in which they arise and are experienced within. So these uh, feelings do not only stem from the emergence of COVID, but it is also 
the context that it is uh, uh, experienced in. And when I say context, I mean the, the social and the political and the economic context. Because when we uh, um, look at the experience of any of the um, interlocutors that Celine spoke with, we hear in their stories how um, the working conditions that they uh, endured and, and dealt with um, uh, are, have had economic dimensions, um, uh, are impacted by the political reality that they lived. For example, uh, the story of uh, one of the healthcare workers who um, have, has had to uh, be isolated in Jerusalem because they could not go back and forth. And this isolation in Jerusalem is uh, imposed, yes, by the need of uh, being isolated due to COVID, but because the restrictions on movement were imposed also by Israeli restrictions on movements on Palestinians solely, not uh, on all of the population that lives within uh, uh, the occupied territories. So uh, this is like just a quick example to show that uh, um, things are really interconnected. Um, and this is something that uh, not only our report uh, and, and the research showed, but uh, the, the structural conditions, um, uh, the structural conditions that uh, uh, we mentioned have been discussed by uh, Dr. Wiam Hamoude in, in, uh, in an article that she wrote for the Palestinian Studies. Um, uh, and Dr. Samah Jabir, who has mentioned that uh, helplines do exist to support the mental health of the community, but we, could not, we cannot think of only uh, providing psychological support to improve mental health without addressing the structural conditions that um, disrupt uh, our ability to build a health system that could address all the health needs of the Palestinian community. And this is where we, uh, uh, <laughs> Israeli, um, uh, uh, the Israeli uh, <laughs> occupation comes into uh, like the picture where every time we try to think of a system, of improving a health system, we need to also think of the many restrictions and, uh, and, and the structural violence, as well as the uh, physical violence that Israel uh, um, uh, imposes on the Palestinian community, as well as its many systems, including the health system. Um, and so th this is what Samah, uh, Dr. Samah Jabir also calls for, is that if we think of any attempt to strengthen mental health and the well-being of Palestinians, we must also think of the legal um, uh, and moral uh, authorities and the international community um, uh, uh, that, that could support uh, the overall uh, situation, not solely zoom in on a specific problem without really being able to deal with the root causes. Yeah, so um, this is something that I, I, I call on to all of you um, to really consider as you read uh, the, the, briefly, the briefing, because as we think of mental health, we don't think of it as the mental health of many individuals, but rather the, a, uh, uh, the mental health of a community, uh, of, of the Palestinian community. Um, uh, so we think of the collective sense as well as the individual self that is embedded in it. Um, so, um, and, and, um, and, Yani, in the same uh, line of thought, uh, Dr. Wiam Hamoud, uh, in her article, she also called on mental health praxis, yeah, uh, that is rooted in justice, uh, in social justice that addresses the structural, political, and social causes um, uh, of uh, well-being at at its roots. So even when we're talking about um, uh, the theme of feeling unrecognized, feeling that um, the social stigma is too, like, too uh, painful to, to bear, um, we must also think that in order for the healthcare system, the Ministry of Health uh, or the, hosp the, the, the hospitals or whichever health centers, the healthcare workers, and if they want to improve working conditions, we need to think of, well, how can they improve the conditions when the entire health system is under great strain and 
shortages, whether it be financial or otherwise, imposed by um, an overall uh, a political um, uh, instability, yeah, and uncertainty. Um, yeah, and then, thank you so much, Zena. I think that's a great time to pass on to pass back to Celine um, to kind of go through some of the report's recommendations and precisely what um, you both found and the research has found is um, important for us to do um, internationally. So I'll pass back over to Celine and thank you again, Zena, for joining us. Thank you, Zena and uh, Hala. Uh, as my colleague Zena has uh, mentioned uh, before, to address the mental health uh, issues experienced by healthcare workers, we must not uh, turn our gazes uh, uh, away from the root causes, uh, but rather to uh, turn our gaze, uh, gaze to the uh, root causes uh, of the destruction of uh, uh, the health uh, system and the health uh, care overall in Palestine uh, for Palestinians. And it is only through this uh, length uh, we must pay attention to also the, the social and political determinants of health. Uh, therefore, this uh, briefing paper also provides some recommendations for the international uh, community. Uh, firstly, uh, we urge uh, the uh, international uh, community to all uh, take uh, necessary uh, measures to guarantee that Israel respects its, its duty as an occupying power uh, toward the health and well-being of Palestinian population uh, by ensuring rapid, comprehensive, and equitable uh, access to essential COVID-19 uh, uh, healthcare goods, including vaccine and PPE, uh, offering financial and other resources uh, as required by the uh, Palestinian Authority to ensure uh, stocks of sufficient uh, quantity and quality. Secondly, uh, 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 pub uh, publicly monitor Israel's com uh, compliance with its uh, obligations uh, under international uh, humanitarian and human rights law uh, in this regard and support international initiatives to promote accountability uh, where uh, these are uh, uh, not met. Uh, provide, uh, thirdly, provide uh, technical, economic, uh, and humanitarian assistance to Palestinian Ministry of Health and uh, well-being of healthcare workers by uh, first ensuring access to financial and material resources needed to address healthcare uh, uh, needs uh, arising from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and to enable the long-term uh, sustainable uh, development of Palestinian healthcare. Secondly, assisting the implementation of a comprehensive program uh, of support for the uh, mental health and well-being of Palestinian health uh, workers, including psychological support uh, services and Childcare and implementing public information campaigns to tackle stigma against healthcare uh, workers. Um, and thank you. Thank you very much, Celine, and thank you to all of our panelists that have joined us today for speaking to us about the report, um, your findings, and the experiences of Palestinian healthcare workers during the pandemic. Um, I'm really glad that we've been able to get together today again in the midst of um, the conversation around UK aid cuts when UK assistance has provided and does provide support for Palestinian healthcare workers. I think it's really important that we keep this in mind as the World Health Organization is um, kind of expressing concern about a potential fourth wave and as the Delta variant has arrived. Um, I do have one question before we move to audience question and answer. Celine, you mentioned that this research had taken place before the latest assault on Gaza and the um, ongoing and excessive use of force against Palestinian protesters. I wonder if you or Dr. Ibrahim um, would be able to speak to us a, a, little bit, a little about how that has added to the impact of um, COVID-19 and what's changed um, for you all, if anything. Um I think it's a very uh, good uh, question, and uh, I will let uh, Dr. Ibrahim uh, to answer it. Uh, as uh, as in, in our previous uh, call, he has mentioned uh, how uh, how uh, the impact of the latest assault on Gaza on uh, uh, the COVID nineteen. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Hold on. I just want to ask you إيش كان تأثير آخر حرب على غزة على قسم هل كانت الكورونا أولوية وكيف أثرت عليكم وعلى الوضع تبع الوباء خلال هاي الفترة مع وجود الحرب هو أول حاجة أنا بحب أقول إنه الحرب كانت حرب شرسة حرب مدمرة 
وحرب تم استخدام فيها يعني أكثر أدوات القتل تطورا في العالم تم فيها استخدام أكثر يعني أكثر القنابل المدمرة على مستوى العالم قنابل يعني كانت لما يعني عندما تسقط على بعد كيلومتر كان نشعر بزلزال موجود في المكان حقيقة يعني حقيقة لو في مؤشر لزلزال ريختر حيكون في زلزال بيقيس لا يقل عن أربع أو خمس خمس أو ست درجات أو أربع درجات ريختر من الاهتزاز في 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 المباني طبعا هذا خلى الناس يعني تنسى شيء اسمه كورونا حقيقة يعني حتى إحنا يعني نسينا إنه في موجود كورونا في الدنيا يعني ممكن في بعض الاحيان كان الانسان ينسى انه يعني ينسى اسمه من من روع الاحداث اللي كنا نشوفها طبعا يعني استشهد لنا او توفي لنا عدد من الزملاء في هذه الحرب من الاطباء اللي لا ذنب لهم الا انهم يعني كانوا بيأدوا مهامهم احنا كنا يعني كنا نروح على العمل تبعنا كنا نذهب الى العمل ونعود في اماكن في او الطريق اثناء الطريق كان في اماكن يعني اماكن شرطيه تابعه للحكومه واماكن ممكن ان يتم قصفها فهذا كان الانسان يشعر الانسان بالخوف من لحظه خروجه من البيت وحتى وصوله الى المستشفى فكان الاهل دائما مجرد ما نصل يتصلوا وصلت او ما وصلت للمستشفى يعني هو يعني احنا خارجين ويعني الانسان مش عارف حاله راح يصل حي ولا راح يتوفى في الطريق وكذلك حال اثناء العوده لما نطلع من المستشفى حتى نعود الى البيت كل هذه المدة الزمنية اللي احنا بنعودها كلها طبعا مليئة بالمخاطر مليئة بالخوف اثناء الدوام ايضا كمان كان في خوف لانه ممكن يكون في خصف لاماكن قريبة اماكن قريبة من المستشفى وهذا تم في اماكن كثيرة تم في خصف اماكن قريبة من مستشفى الشفاء مجمع الشفاء الطبي عيادة الرمال اللي فيها وزارة الصحة اصيب فيها احد الزملاء واصاب خطيرة وفي العناية المركزة ولا زال في العنايه المركزه بوضع خطير اصيب كثير من الطواقم الطبيه اثناء تاديه تاديه مهامها الطبيه فالمرضى نفسه لما كانوا بيجوا على المستشفى كان مريض ياتي وهو في حاله من الخوف من الرعب الشديد من الطريق بعض المرضى كان ياتي عن مسافه 20 او 50 فأمام كل هذه الظروف الصعبة وهذه الظروف الرهيبة التي تشبه يوم القيامة المريض والمرول والطواقم الطبية تقريبا إلى حد كبير نسينا قصة كورونا يعني ما لم يبقى سوى الماسك محطوط ويعني لكن التفكير كله والخوف كله من موضوع الحرب مين راح تفقد مين راح ينصاب هل انت ستكون من ضمن المفقودين؟ هل انت ستكون من ضمن الناس الجرحى؟ انت حتى في بيتك غير امن، يعني حتى لما بتصل بيتك انت مش امن في بيتك، كثير من الاماكن من الناس يعني توفوا او اصيبوا او قتلوا في وهم في في اثناء بقوثهم في البيت ولا ذنب لهم الا انه يعني جاروا او بعيد عنه في موقع يشتبه انه موقع عسكري، منطقه يعني منطقه فيها شيء يعني امني ما بتعرف. لكن كثير من المناطق او التي قصفت مناطق مدنيه يعني بيوت مدنيه وهدمت على روس ساكنيها هذا بيجعل الانسان في حاله من الرعب المستمر على مدار 24 ساعه ما في نوم يعني انا ما كنت انام انا بذكر لل 11 يوم من الحرب انا ما نمت في ال 11 يوم يعني 11 يوم كلها ما نمت 11 ساعه ما في نوم ما بتقدر ما بتقدر انك يعني تاخذ قسم الراحه فهذا انه الموجود اعظم بكثير من الموضوع علشان هيك موضوع كورونا يعني كانت حاضره بشكل ضعيف جدا شكرا كثير دكتور ابراهيم ثانك يو دكتور ابراهيم ثانك يو سليم ام ريلي ابريشيت ام يو بوت سبيكين اباوت ذات اند ابولوجيز فور ذا ام سلايت كونكشن ايشوز از ويل Um, the latest assault on Gaza, as you mentioned, was definitely and kind of terrifying. Um, and according to nine UN experts, um, the kind of targeting of civilian objects of hospitals of Al Shifa Medical Center, as Dr. Ibrahim mentioned, um, may amount to war crimes. We have a question from Hoki Walker in the audience that um, asks what Israel's obligations are under international law. 
for the health of the people in the occupied territory, for the health of Palestinians. I'll also just add that we do have Rohan Talbot here, who is our advocacy and campaigns manager at MAP, um, who may want to join in, jump in on this question as well. But that is one to all of the panelists. I'll let, I'll let you pick up. Shall I jump straight in? And um, feel free to add onto this. It's an important question because I think there's a lot of conversations about um, duties and there certainly have been um, around the issue of um, vaccines, for example. And what I'll do in the chat after this is just provide a link to a, a position paper that we put out in, in February that, that talks very much about the legal um, duties and obligations of Israel as an occupying power um, towards the health of, of the, the population in, um, that it occupies. In brief, Israel remains an occupying power in the West Bank and in Gaza, um, and of course in the East Jerusalem as well. And as, su as such, it is bound by international humanitarian law in those territories. There are two key provisions that I would point you towards in the Fourth Geneva Convention. Article 56, which places on Israel the duty of ensuring and maintaining, with the cooperation of national and local authorities, the medical and hospital establishments and services, public health and hygiene in the occupied territory, with particular reference to the adoption and application of prophylactic and preventative measures necessary to combat the spread of contagious diseases and epidemics. That includes obviously vaccines, PPE, et cetera. And then the article that precedes it, Article 55, gives the occupying power the duty to the fullest extent of the means available to it to ensure that the food and medical supplies of the population uh, and to bring in necessary foodstuffs, medical stores, and other articles if the resources of the occupied territory are inadequate. Um, that's not to say, of course, that the Palestinian Authority don't have any legal obligations here, but they have duties under international human rights law, which is a different body of law. And that is only those duties only apply to the extent um, that it has um, control or effective control over the enjoyment of those rights. And, and as you've heard through um, the really valuable contributions in both Gaza and the West Bank, the imposition of a 14 year blockade, the fragmentation of the Palestinian healthcare system, the um, limitations and discriminatory planning regime in Area C of the West Bank, etc. All of these things um, limit um, severely the, the um, ability of the Palestinian Authority to, to guarantee some of those, um, some of those things. Um, so yes, in, 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 in basic terms, the Fourth Geneva Convention is, is the legal framework that, that needs to be applied. And clearly, as we see, it, it often isn't. Thank you, Rohan. Celine, Ibrahim, Zain, I don't know if you wanted to add more to that. Maybe just a reminder that uh, all borders or all um, entry points, um, whether it be by land or by sea, are under Israeli control. So in any case, any kind of importation of a vaccine is also uh, under the mercy of uh, Israeli control. So even if the Palestinian Authority and when the Palestinian Authority does uh, get uh, the support in, in the form of vaccine, uh, this is also um, uh, controlled and um, uh, uh, surveilled by Israel itself. Thank you, Zaina. And I can see we've just had Rosanna Allen Khan join the call. So I think maybe we'll have one more question and then pass over for a few words. Um, so last question is from Stella Charman, and I'm, I'll put it towards Celine and Zaina. Um, are there any organizations, or did you find in the research, any organizations that have offered individual online psychological support to Palestinian healthcare professionals throughout the crisis? Um, yeah, we'd love to hear a little bit more about what you found in terms of what support was available. Um, from throughout the, the, the actual uh, research, um, the interviews, and correct me if I'm wrong, Celine, none, very few of them actually uh, noted their need for counseling or psychological support. They noted that they need support in other forms so that they can feel better in their mental health. So again, a lot of times to feel uh, better in our mental health, there are many sources of, of stress that we can address, such as working conditions, such as the provision of uh, better uh, support from family, um, access to our network, social networks, and uh, uh, networks of colleagues. This 
uh, is what we were uh, mentioning is, is has been um, lacking or uh, scarce or difficult to access. So um, that's one thing. But on the other hand, like at the same time, I am aware and um, although maybe um, uh, it hasn't been accessed much, um, uh, but there was uh, there were efforts to provide uh, some support, some mental health support for healthcare workers through the uh, mental health unit at the, the Ministry of Health. Um, and uh, many organizations uh, set up hotlines um, uh, so that all the population can actually access um, online psychological uh, uh, support. But again, uh, this is on the very um, individual level um, and, and can address these uh, individual experiences, but does not address all the other forms that continuously um, impact negatively on uh, people's mental health. Thank you, Zaina. Uh, Celine, did you have anything to add before we switch over? No, I just agree with uh, my uh, colleague Zena. And um, although uh, healthcare workers, uh, some of them uh, mentioned that they needed uh, their uh, support, but others uh, mentioned uh, bettering the conditions, uh, working uh, working conditions, such as providing them with the uh, uh, medical essentials, PPEs, uh, medicines, and uh, helping them not to feel helpless uh, in, in the times of pandemic uh, and uh, throughout their uh, uh, work. Thank you. Thank you, Celine, and thank you to all our panelists. Um, I do see that Rosanna has joined us. We're very grateful to have her with us. Dr. Rosella, Rosanna, excuse me, Alan Khan is a doctor in labor and for tooting. Um, she served as the shadow minister for mental health since 2020. Um, Rosanna has a master's in public health and has previously worked as a humanitarian doctor across the Middle East, Africa, and Asia, including in Gaza and Israel. Um, so we're very thrilled to have her join us today on this discussion around COVID-19 and mental health. And thank you for squeezing us in. I'll, um, I'll pass over to you for a few words. Oh, thank you so much, Hannah. I think you squeezed me in. I think that's actually what's happened here. I'm so sorry uh, that this didn't quite go as planned, but that, that's the nature of politics with, with sort of last last minute things. And um, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you've, you've sort of done this really important report. I think uh, obviously I have um, experience with MAP and I've been in the region. I, I know the incredible work that MAP do. And some of the things that I saw even before the pandemic, things like, you know, young fathers not getting the cancer treatment they needed in a timely way and dying, um, young babies being separated from, from their mothers just after the mothers have given birth and the mums not being allowed to be with them. The, the inhumane treatment of the Palestinians is something that would affect any frontline health workers' mental health at the best of times. And I know it certainly affected mine in the sort of last 12 years that I've been working with the Palestinians um, across the Middle East. But all of this is before COVID hit. And um, I actually uh, really just, I am in awe. I'm in absolute awe of everybody working on the front line uh, from MAP and other, you know, other professionals that you, you know, work with when you're there. Because I just, I, I honestly don't know how you did it. Work, you know, working on the front line in England, um, which had its own struggles, but is is you know very developed without without such a divided system as to who's allowed healthcare and who isn't. It was hard enough. So I can't even imagine the toll that the sort of you know pandemic would have had on you know on your mental health. And I think it's uh, just really important that we remember as well, and I know that this doesn't often make me um, flavor du jour, but that the other additional crises that have faced Palestinian communities um, has added just an extra wound that has been almost impossible to bear considering the pandemic and the original state of, of the uh, situation for Palestinians in Israel and Gaza. So I just thank you very much for having me today for the short time that I'm able to be here. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to you know, chair the event, but I'm sure you've had a phenomenal discussion. And I can see friends on here, like Afsal Khan, I can see him, his smiley face there in the, you know, the corner. And I know that um, though it might feel like a very lonely space sometimes, just know that you have friends 
and colleagues and people thinking of you all the way over here and fighting as hard as we can to have your voices heard. And the report uh, strengthens our ability to do that as well because it gives us more evidence which we can present. So thank you very, very much for all that you do and know that I will be a lifelong supporter and friend of Matt. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Really grateful to have had you join us um, and for your such kind words. Um, and I think that really goes out to our teams on the ground as well. Um, we, it's been an absolutely um, exhausting year for everyone, but as you mentioned, for Palestinians especially, it's been compounded a thousand times over. Um, really grateful to have had everyone join us today, both the panelists, um, the MPs, as you mentioned, Rosanna, I can see Asal Khan is with us and a few others, and the audience. We're really grateful to have had you all here and engaged. Um, if you would like to follow up with our work, I think Joe has put in the chat both the link to MAP's website, which again is map.org.uk, and Carl Boo's website if you'd like to support them as well. Please do take a look through our work. Do be in touch if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for MAP's work in the future. Thank you again for everyone that's come to join us and thank you to Carl Boo for co-hosting with us.